introduce to you, I have the great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Pastor Joe Centineo. He is the pastor, senior pastor of Crossroads Church, this church, our host church. And he is going to bring us a word out of Psalm 23 as we continue with our series, The Summer in the Psalms. Joe, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joey. All right. It's great to, to okay. see you guys. I feel a little uncomfortable here. I'm in this spot. I've been in this spot for over 16 years. Right here, standing here, preaching every Sunday morning. And it is great to see you guys. Um, they wanted me to use that, that pulpit, but if you haven't noticed, it's probably going to be a little high for me. <laughs> But let me tell you, this pulpit here was built by a man that used to attend our church. His name was Mark Weiss, a Jewish man that was not a believer. And he became a believer before he suddenly died. He's a young guy in his, uh, I think, late 30s. And he had a brain hemorrhage and just died. But we believe, we're not positive, but we believe that he had come to the Lord. He was so on, just on the brink of that. But you know, I think about if there was a church like this, you know, it would have made things a little easier for him and his parents who all used to come and they never did become believers, at, at least as far as I know. So I figured I'd use this pulpit first and plus you could see me if I'm using this one. <laughs> I want to bring you greetings. If you heard about eight weeks ago, I had my hip replaced and I'm doing amazing. I've played golf, I believe, nine times since then. Wow. So I'm back to normal. Um, Thank you for your prayers. Crossroads is doing great. My family is great. And Sukkot is great, right? Yeah. Joey and I had lunch on Thursday, and he told me just about how, how things are going so well. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but he and I, we see ourselves as partners. Yeah. Now, shouldn't all churches see ourselves that way? Yeah. 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 But we actually are working towards partnering and doing things better because we think that we can be better together Amen. than we are alone. Amen. And uh, I think that that's absolutely true. So, um, and listen, I've got some common ground with, with the Jewish people. Uh, first of all, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so uh, my best friend growing up, his name was Robert Feldman. Okay? He was a Jew. And my girlfriend, uh, before I, right before I became a believer, she caused me to find Christ. Wasn't a good thing, okay? Um, but but her she her last name was Schwartz, okay? And she was she was a non-believing Jew. I was a non-believing Catholic. But through that circumstance, the Lord brought me to Him. <coughs> this morning, I'm really excited to share with you about uh, for perhaps I think the most famous passage of Scripture in all the Bible, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, I mean, uh, most people are familiar with that. And it refers to the Lord as our shepherd. Okay. And uh, I want to share with you this afternoon what I've learned about the Lord being my shepherd. I've been walking with Jesus for 39 years, and, and he has been my shepherd to me. And I want to share about that. So this is going to be easy. I really didn't need notes, but I, I did the notes because Joey told me I had to. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. Um, but I want to talk about the role of a shepherd concerning his shepherding his fleet, his flock, his sheep. Okay? Uh, the shepherd took a, a lot of care for the sheep. He uh, provided companionship with them. Okay? And, and, and he knew them, many by name. Uh, he provided for them food as he took them out to pasture and to eat. He, he gave them exercise, he gave them rest, and he gave them protection. He was truly a shepherd, and when you do a study of the Lord as our shepherd, in John chapter 10, I preached on that just a couple of months ago. It, it's amazing how, how God has given us this opportunity to have him as our shepherd. Um, so let's dive into this amazing psalm and glean all we can considering the Lord as our shepherd. Now, um, I'm going to point out some things that are somewhat obvious, but maybe we forget them. So it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, we got to stop. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me that we drew the straw of all the shepherds, right, that we got the Lord to be our shepherd? 
He's the one. Now listen, because you can forget this. We know it. You know, in fact, I stopped memorizing scripture a long time ago. You know why? When I memorize scripture, it goes into my rote memory. This is how my peculiar brain works. It goes into my rote memory and it no longer means anything to me. Because I just ought to, so I had to stop memorizing. So I decided I'm going to become so familiar with the scriptures, I won't memorize them. I'll know them so well that it won't go into the rote memory and I'll be able to embrace it. So listen to this. The Lord is our shepherd. Yes. Are you kidding me? Wow. What a shepherd. It's amazing. Guess who just hit the lottery? We did. We did. And he says, the Lord, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Of course you're not going to want. How could you want when the Lord is your shepherd? But that doesn't always play out that way, now does it? Because we forget. How could we want if the Lord is our shepherd? The Lord as our shepherd. When we remember He's our shepherd. He's able to provide all that we need so we do not lack anything. Because we realize that we have all we need. Now listen, it's not that he ever doesn't, you know, well, I don't realize that. I don't have all I need. No, you don't realize that in him you have all you need. So you think you have lack. And your lack, your thinking you have lack causes you to not even appreciate the very things that he's provided for you. See, and none of this is in my notes, Joe. I didn't really need the notes because, you know why? Because for 39 years, I have experienced what it's like to be one of his sheep. Even though oftentimes I wander and I forget the fact that I have the greatest shepherd in the world. But he's still there for me. Now, let me tell you something I learned. See, because I was in a relationship with, with a girl. I was 22 years old and we were planning to get married. We were together two years. And I met her, and the night I met her, I guess I can say this, uh, I didn't know the Lord, she didn't, and we had relations with each other together, as if we were married, only we weren't, okay? Okay, you get the feeling? And we lived together for two years, and we were planning to get married, and after two years, I find out that this woman was cheating on me from the day that we met. And I remember when we got together that night, we met at, I'm sorry to admit this, I'll give away my age, we met at a disco. <laughs> Look, if you were alive back then, you were. It was cool. I'm sorry. I, I know. There's no defense of disco. I met her in a disco, and she told me that night. Uh, she said, "Wow, I've never, I never do this. I've never done this with someone the day that I meet them." And I knew that wasn't true. Yeah. But I wanted to believe it. And um, when I found out that she had been cheating on me with multiple guys the entire time I knew. And now listen, I was no moral person, but I never once cheated on her. I was never unfaithful. Okay? So those were my warped kind of morals. Okay? I didn't know the Lord, though. And um, when I found that out, I remember I went back to my apartment in New York, and I had decided I'm going to end my life. And then I had another thought. I'm going to kill her. <laughs> and that was the crossroad in my life. Because in my apartment in Brooklyn, New York, I got on my knees and I cried out to a God. I had no idea if he even existed and I didn't know who he was. But I said, God, if you are alive, if you exist, I am about to do something really drastic. Like kill myself, kill her, or maybe both. And I said, God, if you are real, I need you. Please show yourself to me. And he reached down from heaven into this seven-story house that I lived in and reached all the way down to my apartment and touched my heart. Amen. And I remember, I was like, oh my gosh, you're real. But I had no idea who he was. I didn't know it was Jesus. I was raised Catholic, but it meant nothing to me. Nothing. And I was like, now, I forgave her, and I was like, now I have to go and find out who it is that touched my heart. And within a week, I was invited to an evangelical church, okay? So for the Catholic, the evangelical church is the church that believes the Bible. They, the Protestant Reformation really was about evangelicals, the formation of evangelicals. But we just don't remind Catholics of that. There's so many Catholics in our church. And it's like, hey, man, I, we're Catholics, part of the universal body of Christ. But I went to a church and I never experienced anything like it. But I didn't listen to the pastor. 
I just looked at the people. And as I was in this large church in Staten Island, New York, I had to drive over the bridge, pay a $7 toll just to get to church. Little did I know I would be going to that church five times a week. <laughs> I didn't even listen to the pastor. I just looked at the people. I was like, oh my gosh, they have something that I don't have. And the fourth week, I listened. And I gave my heart to Jesus. And then I did it for nine weeks after that in a row just to make sure because the way I was living when I leave church didn't line up with what I was. But after a while, I got it. Got it. And I remember ending the relationship with the girl. When I met with her the day after, I found out on a Sunday night, the night that I, I hit that crossroads. By the way, that's why the church is called Crossroads. <laughs> And I remember when I was on my knees and God touched my heart and I met with her the next day and for two hours she lied to me. I know I've never done that, but I knew. I, just, I knew because I, I, I talked to some of her friends and they told me. We, in the, we know how to, Italians from New York know how to get information out of people. <laughs> <laughs> and when she finally admitted it to me, you're right, I've been cheating on you since the day we met with multiple guys, but I'll never do it again, let's stay together. <laughs> and I said, I said, listen, I forgive you, but it's over. I've got to find God. Now, I, to a girl who was 100% Jewish, and she said, who? <laughs> it was so foreign to me and to her growing up in New York City. The idea of God, having a relationship with God, having the Lord as our shepherd was so foreign to me. I said, I, I know it sounds crazy, but I've got to find him. And I did. And, and, and you know what? I wound up when I, be, I became a believer, and then I, I realized that everything I had done with girls was wrong. All of it. I remember reading in the Bible, I started reading the Bible shortly after I became a believer. In New York, maybe like Messianic Christians, when we find Jesus, we're serious. And I remember reading, if a man looks on a woman to lust for her, he's committed adultery in his heart. I was like, say what? <laughs> You're not even supposed to think it? I've been doing that as long as I could find someone to participate. <laughs> with no idea that it was wrong. And I remember I was like, I think I need to not date. I took two years where I, I couldn't trust myself because I didn't know how to treat a woman the way God wants a woman to be treated. By the way, I'm married for now almost 32 years. Amen. My wife and I, I wish the teenagers were here, because my wife and I stayed sexually pure until we were married and then we were sexually pure even though we came together. We did it God's way. But I remember I couldn't trust myself to be with, with a woman, so I didn't date at all. And then when I was getting ready to date, um, and by the way, there were very few Christian girls that I met that had that standing. I couldn't understand. I was like, man, you were raised in the church. I just got here. And I've got to tell you that? You know? Um, but I remember understanding this principle, that when you're single, is anyone here single? Raise your hand if you're single. When you're single, until you realize that God alone is enough, you're not ready for a spouse. You see, because a lot of us, when we're single, we think that that person, that special person, is going to become our shepherd, become our meaning for life. It doesn't work that way. Men make great husbands. Well, some, okay. Women, I'm with you. I understand. Men can be jerks. Not the men here. Okay. But other men. Yeah, not the men here. Not the men at Crossroads. Okay. But men make great husbands, but terrible gods. And women make great wives, but terrible gods. So until you're content being single, you're not ready to be married because you're going to place that person in the place that only God can fill. Now, I'm only through verse 1. Not even. i got to move quickly. But I want to share with you what I've learned about the Lord as my shepherd. In my early years as a believer, I would drive 45 minutes from Brooklyn to Staten Island, pay all those tolls, and in that time, I got to know the Lord as my shepherd. 
I had no friends because all my friends abandoned me. I couldn't go to the places they were going, do the things I, that they were doing. So it was me and him. And during those rides, back and forth, back and forth, I would pray. And I would, and, and the Lord became my shepherd. And when you know him as your shepherd, you don't, you realize you have not lacked anything. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Green pastures, meaning that he provides lavish sustenance for us. His word and his presence. Amazing. Still waters. He gives us the opportunity to experience peace even in the midst of the storm. Yes. Have you experienced that? Yes. You know, we were talking about cracks in the song, and I had the thought uh, about the cracks. There's three kinds of people in life. You either have had cracks and you filled them, or you um, have cracks and you're begging him to fill them at this point, or you're going to realize you have other cracks that are yet to be filled. You see, it's a constant process. Of God, because what He does is He brings the cracks to the surface. Because when He fills them, we become more whole. And 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 you know, He provides us with everything we need. Now I want to ask you a question: Do you have a place? Do you have a place that you meet Him? See, for me, it's my hot tub. If I look a little shriveled. Because between last night, an hour, and last night, 45 minutes this morning, my hot tub is one of the places, it's the main place where I pray. You say, Joe, why a hot tub? Because if I pray anywhere else and close my eyes, I fall asleep. <laughs> and I got really tired of feeling guilty about, as a pastor, falling asleep when I pray. I had the worst devotional life of anyone in the world because I kept falling asleep. So, you know what I did? I started to pray walk. And then my hip got bad, and then I was like, okay, you can't keep walking. I would walk from my, I would walk in the middle of the night. I would finish a sermon when I was a youth pastor, and I'd go out walking and just walk because I didn't fall asleep when I was walking. That's probably a good idea, right? <laughs> and then I, I found the hot tub to be a place. It's my place. Like you have a, we have prayer closets. Mine has water in it, okay? <laughs> Do you have a place? See, find the place. Create a place. You know what I did in my backyard? Okay, Joey, you got to come to my house sometime. You, the wife too. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to say, hey, here's my wife. Say hello, but come on. I want to bring you to my backyard because I have created an amazing garden. I used to be a landscaper. And I have flowers, every kind of flower you can imagine. And I will go back there, sit in the hot tub and stare at the flowers. Or, or sit in my chair and just spend time with God. That's my place. Now you say, Joe, I look at flowers and, you know, I, I don't get it great find your place maybe it's biking maybe it's it's walking maybe, I don't really care but my question to you is do you have a place that he stills the waters yes. see I, I go in that hot tub at night and there are times that I am you know being a pastor is not the easiest thing and he stills my heart if the storms don't go away but the peace comes in the midst he says John I'll put you right in the eye of this storm, and you're going to experience peace beyond all understanding. Verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He keeps us healthy and flourishing spiritually, no matter what we face. Now, Joy, I don't have, I know you guys are big on being here all day, but I can go on all day now about the storms that God's allowed in my life. And I say it, and you can laugh. I mean, laugh at everything. I laugh at myself all the time. But it's really not that funny. I, I wrote this book called Encounters with God. Because I did a series once, and I, I, I was talking about my experience with, experiences with God, and it was a seven-week series. It turned into eight. And I remember right here in the church, and I always said, I'm not going to write a book. I had worked for... Lots of pastors that wrote books. I was like, I don't want to write a book. 
I don't want to try and put God in some kind of box and, and make things cheesy and, you know, God's a mysterious. Walking with God is mysterious, but I did, I was doing this series and people are like calling me up, Joe, it's Friday, we're going away this week to Hawaii. I wish I could cancel it. I don't want to miss this, this Sunday. I was like, what are you talking about? Well, because my, my life is a, like a holy drama. Okay? I have been, and, 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 and after I finished that series, they said, people said, Joe, you've got to write it down. It's, it's, it's comical. It's a holy drama. But I wrote this book. It took me two years to write it because I'm not a writer. And um, the funny thing is, 40% of the book I've titled The School of Brokenness. I had no idea when I told the Lord, yes, when he called me to ministry, yes, I'll be a pastor. I was thinking of grandeur. I stand and speak and people sit at my feet and listen to my words of wisdom that I glean from the Spirit. And the Lord says, Joe, I have to crack well, I have to show you your cracks. And then you have to experience me filling the holes, the cracks, with myself, which is perfect. That was such a great word picture. So that I can use you. Because, Joe, I have to break you to use you. Had I known that back then, I'd have said, not for me. I'll stay in the landscaping business. I was a landscaper. <laughs> Now, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But back then, he knew I couldn't handle what was coming. So he just called me. And I said, yes. And, and these books are in the back. You probably see them. These are available. I, I would love for maybe one per family. Just feel free to take them. There's no charge. We don't charge for anything. You know, we, it's a pattern, okay? We don't charge for anything. Okay? Freely you receive, freely we give. So take one of these books and read it, and you will see. You'll be like, because right now, maybe you look at me and say, well, Joe, pretty cool guy. Joe, why is this, that? Read this book, and you'll say, he's just like me. <laughs> that guy was a mess, and he still is a mess, but he is being cleaned up by the only one that can take our lives and clean us up. <laughs> he helps us in our times of struggle. And he brings him into our lives so that we can be more like him. Uh, and you'll read about my wife's illness. Very serious illness. She's had over and over again. It's happened. Um, she was out of our home for five months when my kids were young. I had just started this church. And she was so sick. She has a mental illness okay, um, that she struggles with from time to time. When it comes, it's all over. When it's gone, it's gone. But it has come on, on a few occasions in our lives. And the one time, it, she was out of the house for five months, hospitalized for two months, went through shock therapy. Because she was catatonically depressed. She did not speak a word for two months. She just sat. And God restored her. Amen. Not in my timing. Now, you know what the Lord said to me when I was, she had just gone back to New York. Her parents took her to New York. Because the doctors here said, we can't do anything else. We, we've done all medicine can do for your wife. I was like, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> and the parents came. Again, they were coming every week helping me. I had three young children. I just started this church. And I was like, Lord, why are you? Remember me? I'm your boy. <laughs> it's Joe. <laughs> and the Lord, this is what he said. The night she left for New York, and she wound up being there for five months. Not marriage problems. Not marriage problems. Sick. Very sick, nonverbal. And I got out of the hot tub that night and I felt like I was about to, to break. Because I knew now I'm a single dad, for who knows how long, it's me and the kids. And I remember I was asking the Lord in the hot tub, will you take this away? Take this. And as I got into my, my house from the hot tub, this is what the Lord said. He said, Joe, don't ask me to take this away. He said, I want you to put your arms around this, your wife's illness, and embrace it. You will find my will going through this, not around it. So don't ask me to take it away. I can repeat that. I'll be able to repeat that even if I'm 85 and have Alzheimer's. Okay? 
Because when God speaks, you don't forget. And at that point, I stopped complaining. I just accepted it. And I have found, you'll read it in the book, how I, we, and this church found God's will going through that. Not going around it. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That felt like the shadow of death. But listen, I got a whole bunch of other times that I felt like I was walking. I told you, I'm a drama king. Okay? A whole bunch of other times that I felt like I was going through the shadow of death. Okay? But even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You see, that's the promise we have when we have the Lord as our shepherd. That he may allow us to suffer. But during, and during those times, when you're beyond yourself, look, if you're, if you're suffering now, but you're like, I got this. Listen, you're not, you have the faith to deal with what you're going through. So you have the faith, so go through it. But when you are asked to go through something and it, it supersedes the faith that you have, now you're in the shadow of death. And you feel like, I can't do this. And the Lord's like, you're right, you can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour into you and I'm going to fill some of those cracks and now I'm going to give you perseverance. So as you go through this trial, you can do more. Yes. Because I'm trying to make you perfect and complete. And this is how I do it. Anyone want to be a pastor? We're going to do an ordination service next week, right, Joe? During times like that, we're, fear, we're filled with fear and anxiety. He says, I will fear no evil, though, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. Your rod, the times... Look, a lot of my suffering, I brought it off. So it was like, Joe, I've been work, I've been tapping you on the shoulder to deal with some things. You're not dealing with them. So now I have to step in. The crack is getting bigger, and I've got to fill it. So I'm going to bring this out to the forefront, and you're going to suffer, but I'm doing it because I love you. So hang on. It's going to get scary. You're right. Sometimes God has to hurt us so that we no longer wander away. Do you know what the shepherd, you guys, I'm intimidated to talk about things. The old, uh, Joe, you asked me to talk on the Old Testament. Thanks a lot. Talk to a messianic congregation about the Old Testament. Now, I've been to Israel, and I've studied the Old Testament, but it's a little intimidating, but that's okay. Bear with me. But the shepherd carried a rod, and the rod, oftentimes, the sheep that would wander, the shepherd knew that sheep was going to be devoured. So he would get that sheep that continued to wander, and he would take the sheep, and he would use the rod to break its leg. And then he would take that sheep with a broken leg that couldn't walk and he'd put it around his neck. And during the time that the leg healed, the shepherd broke the leg because he loved the sheep. And during the time that the shepherd had the sheep around his neck, they created such a bond that when the leg healed and the sheep was placed down, the sheep would never wander from the shepherd again. Now I want to tell you something that God has had to break my legs on numerous occasions. And in those times of him restoring me and taking me closer to him, I have learned that I, I will never. Where would I go? Wander away from Jesus? Are you kidding me? Remember, the Lord is our shepherd. Where would I go? There's nowhere to go. But sometimes, he has to hurt us. He has to break us so that we understand how much we need him. He says, it says that rod, your rod and your staff, the staff was used to rescue. You know, the sheep would be going down the cliff. You've seen the picture. I mean, I know it's a little cheesy, but, and, and, and the shepherd is pulling the sheep up with the hook of the staff. He rescues us. He rescues. He's not going to let us fail. You're going to feel like you're going to fail at times. You feel like the whole world is coming apart. But the Lord is our shepherd. He doesn't let us fail. Verse 5. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. He says, You prepare a table before me in the presence 
of my enemies. So, I mean, when I'm around an enemy, I, I, my adrenaline starts kicking in, right? We feel like we have to protect ourselves. But the Lord paints it, and David had enemies. His father-in-law, right? Saul, coming after him. Do you know how long David ran from Saul? By the way, David had already been anointed as king when he was about 16. Before he killed Goliath, David already was anointed as the next as king. But he had to live a long time. And he, he killed Goliath, and then Saul took him into the house, gave him Michael as his daughter. He would come in, play, and then Saul started throwing spears at him. Remember? Trying to kill him. That was his father-in-law. And do you know when David finally ran for his life because he and Jonathan were able to figure out that... Saul was not going to be happy until David was dead. Do you know how long he ran from Saul? How many years? He was on the run living as a destitute in caves, in, in the mountains, you know, 10 years. 10 years. He was on the run, anointed as king, but the Lord was using that time to break him and to mold him into the man that he would need to be how the Lord works. So it says that he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. If you feel like you have enemies, don't worry. The Lord is not phased by your enemies. They don't threaten him at all. In fact, he's going to provide for you in their midst and perhaps in their sight. You just don't have to, and you don't have to fight your battle. Second part of verse 5. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You're calling and you're anointing. You see, you could ask my wife. Um, there have been so many times, every, it used to be every year, I would have a little talk. Honey, we need to talk. And I would tell her, um, honey, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave the ministry. I need to quit. Why? I'm ineffective. So, as a youth pastor, God gave me so many blessings. But I always felt like, I always felt like I was behind the eight ball. I have a poor self-image. See, I'm already telling you, read the book. Because you're going to see, do you have a poor self-image? Yes, I do. Second-born male. Okay. Short. Did you notice? <laughs> did you notice I'm short? So, you know what I did most of my life growing up? I, I fought. Like, believe it or not, I know it's really bad. Don't judge me. I was a bully. When bullying was kind of cool. It's not cool now. Don't bully. And I'm not saying it was right. But every time I walked into a room, I, I thought people would look and say, look how short that guy is, because that's how I felt about me. So I would look at them and say, what are you looking at? Like, Nothing. I, and I'm ready to fight them. All the way through high school. I'm playing football to prove something. To prove, even though I'm short, I can still score touchdowns. I'm playing, I'm trying to prove something my whole life. See, and, and so when I got to ministry, those things don't necessarily go away. You have a poor self-image, it's a crack. But I'll tell you one thing. When you have a poor self-image, you don't steal God's glory. Amen. See, I would rather struggle to have a healthy self-image than to struggle with pride. This is where God, God wants us to have a healthy self-image. We live here. Yes. I live here, and on a good day, I can bump up to here. The person that struggles with pride lives here, yes. and on a bad day, they bump down to here. <laughs> and the Lord told me, Joe, I'm going to even use your poor self-image, but you're not going to ever quit. Because you don't need to. Because what you think is ineffective, don't worry. So I don't steal this glory. I'm always trying to say, wow, I, I, am I worth my salary? You know, my, all these things. Pat, you know pastors go through that. Okay? We want to know that we're worth the money that people are <coughs> sacrificing to give us. Um, but our calling, he never takes it away. It's like, Joe, you're broken and you're a mess. Could you do me a favor? This is what I sensed the Lord telling me before I wrote this book. Would you do me a favor? Would you let people know how messed up you are? Because they all think pretty highly of you. So when you let them know how messed up you really are and how I'm keeping you together, then they know there's hope for them. And that's how I, I wish all pastors could pastor that way, but most pastors, they don't have... See, my, my, my self-image has gotten a lot better now that I don't have to defend myself. 
I don't have to put up. I can just say, Lord, you have said I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, so I am. And other pastors don't know that. So they have to keep up this image. And I'll tell you this. Don't ever let Joey get to that place. You don't let him get And don't let him get to that place because it's a very lonely place to be. The, it's never enough. The number of people is never enough. The buildings are never nice enough. And But when we know... See, God gave me... He restored my, my self-image when he said, I made you five foot four and one seventh. <laughs> taking it all. Not leaving anything out. I'm taking it all. But when he told me he made me that way, I was like, so who cares what anyone else thinks? You can talk, tease me about being sure I make fun. I love it's fun. I'm exactly the height that God made me to be. Amen. 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 You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord's goodness and mercy. You know how sometimes when something goes good, people say, God is good. I don't like that. I don't like that because people are connecting God's goodness with their circumstance. That could turn very quickly, correct? Yes. God is good all the time. All the time. All the time. But even though we kind of know that, we don't. Because when things go bad, what's wrong? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with me? No, God, life happens. But the Lord's goodness and mercy, it's who he is. It's there for us. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. As bad as things might get someday, when we remember that someday we're going to be with him. 